Good evening, church. It's so good to be with y'all, and uh, I'm so grateful for uh, Steve and Pastor um, and the other elders for allowing me this opportunity to get up here. Uh, I consider this just a great honor uh, and privilege to be here before y'all tonight and to be in God's Word, um, hearing uh, what we uh, can learn from First Peter. Tonight, we are going to be in First Peter chapter 1. Uh, verses 13 through 25 uh, in the Bible there in the seat backs in front of you. It's uh, on page 1014. And if I were to give this sermon a title, the title is Living Inside a Future Hope. Um, First Peter is one of my favorite books of the Bible because Peter does a really good job of laying out the gospel message clearly to begin with and then I'm, I'm what you would call a very practical guy, I like a lot of practical application. And Peter does a, um, lays out a numerous practical um, applications throughout the remainder of First Peter. And uh, so for someone like me, it's a very helpful tool and, and book of the Bible. So with that being said, let's dive right in. Uh, verse 13, therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, Set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout time of your exile knowing that you were ransomed for the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. Like that of a lamb without blemish or spot, he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God." Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth of, for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this is the word, and this word is the good news that was preached to you. All right, the Word of God. So there in verse 13, Peter starts out with therefore. And so therefore what? What is he pointing to? And Peter is pointing back, if we were to read all of chapter one, the first 12 verses, what we would see is Peter is pointing back to Christ and the picture and gift of salvation. Look at verse 10. He is literally saying concerning this salvation, that the prophets prophesied. Peter is saying, therefore, because of our salvation, because of the good gift of salvation, so therefore what? Our hope is in our future resurrection and life everlasting. Therefore, because our hope is in our salvation, we are called to what Peter is about to walk us through, through what scripture is going to identify for us. And it's made possible by God the Father and his great mercy. So therefore, because of Jesus Christ and the life he lived, the death we deserve, his burial and resurrection for you and I, we now do what? So if we were called to prepare our mind for action here, Peter goes on and says, Therefore, preparing your minds for action. So how, do, how does this happen? How do we prepare for action? And so as I was preparing for um, this weekend's sermon and, and going through all this, I began to think, well, what are some other things that we prepare for? As students, we prepare for test taking. When I was a student, I didn't probably prepare well enough for that, my mom would say. I know in work, anytime I have a big presentation to a client or meeting in front of a client, I'm typically well prepared, thinking about the project, thinking about what I need to talk about, 
being well-versed in, in the information that I'm going to present. Or I can remember as I took my wife out on our first date. I, I prepared myself well, I will say. I put on a clean pair of jeans. I wore a clean shirt. You know, I tried to look my best. I put on nice cologne. And, and so I wanted to be well-prepared. Perhaps you remember that. For that first big date, you wanted to be well-prepared. Or maybe even in becoming a parent. My wife did this way better than me, but read a ton of books. I glanced over the footnotes, and nothing prepared us for raising children. No book, no anything else. But we wanted to be well-prepared. I can remember seeking counsel. I've, I'm the youngest of three, and so I called both of my older brothers. Hey, what does this look like? They said, when you figure it out, call me. So there's nothing wrong with being prepared. We do it for every other thing in life that we want to do well. And as a Christ follower, we are calling peers saying, prepare your minds. Now, being prepared isn't what's going to save us. It's simply what's going to aid us in our walk from day to day. It's what's going to help get us through the valleys. It's what's going to help get us through the mountaintops. Being prepared. And so as we read this passage, how do we need to prepare as a believer? Gathering here in a church body, that's one way to prepare. Being a part of a discipleship group. Reading scripture daily. I know the days that I don't go far worse than the days that I do. Being in prayer and communication. Seeking wise counsel that's going to point me to Christ in scripture. Peter goes on to say we're to be sober-minded. And, and that sober-minded that Peter's talking about, he's talking about thinking rightly about our reality. He's talking about that we live in a sensible life with clarity about Christ and the kingdom to come. So what does that look like? It means not to get caught up that I don't have the biggest house in Coppell. It means being clear-headed about my job is not everything. The view that my spouse has of me is not everything. The view that my children have of me is not everything. It certainly plays a factor in how I feel, and it's certainly a part of how I want to work inside of Christ's kingdom. But it is not everything. We'll get to it here in a second, but Peter's going to talk about a life of exile. He goes on in verse 14 and 15, talking about being obedient children. When we have been called to Christ, when you have been called to Christ, church, you are called to live as an obedient child. Hear me. That's a command. That's not a recommendation. It's not a good suggestion. It's a command that we are called as Christ followers to live a life of obedience. He talks about giving up of our former passions from our former ignorance. Ignorance is a big word that Peter uses there. I know for me, if you were to walk up to me and call me an ignorant person, my flesh would have something to say to you. It would not respond well. And so when Peter says our former ignorance, he's using a big word and a severe word. Those passions are things of lust, lying, foul language, a sharp tongue towards others, the hoarding of our money, the hoarding of our time. Those are the passions when I was not with Christ that my flesh 
lived in. Peter is saying, as a Christ follower, you are called to give up of your flesh, give up of those passions. Why? Because he who called us is holy, and he, being God, has called us to him. God's character and nature is holy and blameless. Genesis 1.26 tells us we were created in his image. We are his image bearers, and we are called to be holy. Verse 16, you shall be holy for I am holy. Look at the screen, and again, we'll see Peter quoting Leviticus 11.44. For I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am holy. You shall not defile yourselves with any swarming thing that crawls on the ground. For I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am holy. God tells his people, tells the Israelites in this passage to consecrate themselves to him. Consecrate, that's a big word for a Texas Tech graduate like myself. So I had to look it up, and it means to dedicate oneself to a sacred purpose. God has consecrated himself to us, and we are called to consecrate ourselves to him. God made that consecration by sending his son on the cross to die the death that we deserve and to be raised to live a life everlasting so that we may one day join him in that life by putting our faith in him, by putting our faith in the work of the cross. God's not partially committed to you and I. God's not halfway in this. He's fully committed to us. We were created as his image bearers for his glory and our good. When we come to a right understanding of the work of the cross, God is glorified and we are made better. We are made anew. Our lives are not our own. We've been bought with a price. That verse 16, you shall be holy for I am holy. Do you feel the weight of that as a Christ follower? That's a condemning verse apart from Christ. On my own, I can't be holy. Apart from accepting Christ as my Lord and my Savior, and allowing him rule and reign in my life, I'll never be holy. You know, this spring I got to uh, help coach my oldest child, Davis, my son, his baseball team. It's been a lot of fun. And as we were getting ready uh, for the season to get started, um, he and I, one late one night, went up to Dick's Sporting Good and and got all the gear. By the way, it's way more expensive than I ever anticipated. And uh, it is we're going through Dick's Sporting Good, buying all the gear, the glove, and and the sh- you know the socks and the belt, and got to get it all to match. We're the Oakland, Oakland Athletics, and we got white pants. And I bought two pair, thinking that one would get dirty, and we'd swap it out because we had two games a week. And what I quickly realized is in seven and eight year old boys they like the dirt and they like to make slides, albeit unnecessary half the time. And um, so just about to a man, everyone on the team has made a slide. And so we kept the second pair of pants in the closet for the longest time. Because I'm cheap, we have since returned it to get money back. But for the longest time, that pair of pants sat in the closet And the other pants, after it got dirty a couple of times, I tried to wash it and bleach it. And I got them cleaner. Some of the dirt stains and grass stains came out, 
But, and maybe from a distance, you could tell that they were white plant pants. Up close, you could see that they had been pretty, pretty torn up, pretty dirty, and week after week, they continued. And it got me to thinking, the same is true. Apart from Christ, we can bleach our lives as much as we want. We can throw our lives through the washer, and maybe it'll fool others around us for a time being. Maybe it even fools ourselves and we think we got a nice looking pair of white pants. But it's only through the blood of Christ that they're made new with the tag still on them and as white as white can be. Scripture tells us we are washed by his blood made white as snow, like the wool of a lamb. So no amount of bleach over our lives allows us that apart from Jesus Christ. That's why verse 16 is condemning apart from Christ. You and I'll never be holy enough. Verse 17, Peter goes on to talk about God being an impartial judge. And he says, so while exiles, we are called to conduct ourselves with a reverent fear. Exiles. I don't know about you and I, but I don't look at my life in exile. We live in a nice house, in a nice city. We have great amenities around us. It's not two minutes down the road before I can just about eat any kind of food and restaurant that we want. I get to drive a nice car. I have a nice job. I don't view my life in exile. But Peter is telling us we are exiles this side of Christ's return. Do you think of your life like that? Do you see your daily living of that in exile? Does it change the way you view going to work tomorrow? Does it change the way you want to talk to your spouse or your child? Peter talks about that reverent fear. That's not meant to be a paralyzing fear of, oh, I should see God and be afraid of God and he's going to punish me if I don't do this, if I don't act that way. If I mess up today and sin, God's going to, I'm, I'm never going to get it. God won't love me. Peter's talking about a reverent fear. That of one, and if you're a parent, you'll understand this. And if you're a child, you'll understand this. Growing up, my dad was good at discipline. And rightfully so, my brothers and I, uh, we got every kind of discipline from spanking to grounding to loss of privilege, so on and so forth. And, um, you know, there were many a time that we got any number of those, maybe even a couple of them, depending on the severity. And what was always the worst, though, growing up is when my dad would come home and we would talk about it and I'd be getting ready for whatever my discipline was. And my dad would sit down and I'd say, what is it, dad? Well, I, I know, I'm sorry. And he would just say, nothing. I just want you to know I'm, I'm disappointed. I know you know better and I'm disappointed. Immediately, my body would sink. That was the worst. And now as a father, I've seen the roles reverse. I've done it in my own children. Where they'll ask, what's my punishment? What's my discipline? And I've simply just said, you know what? You're not gonna have one. I just want you to know I'm disappointed. And I can literally see their cadence change. And it's because they have a reverence for me as their father that they don't wanna disappoint me. They don't wanna hurt me as their dad. That's the fear that Peter is speaking of. That when we sin, when we don't act as obedient children, we're hurting our heavenly father. 
He goes on in verse 18 and 19, talking about with the right perspective of our wretchedness and God's grace for our life, then a life of obedience and reverent fear should be the fruit that you and I show from it. This doesn't mean that we're gonna be perfect in our obedience, but it does mean that when we step back and take a look at our life and survey how our behavior is, what we are doing for Christ's kingdom, his fruit, this obedience, delighting in that command should be evidence. It should be shown that we love our spouses, our children, our neighbors. He talks about in verse 20 and 21, Christ being foreknown. God planned his own son's death because he so deeply loves you and I. Think of that for a moment. Don't walk out of this room today with that being lost on you. God loves you and I so much and wants us to be tethered to him for eternity that he gave of his only son. I don't know about y'all, but if you asked me to give up my, my child for your betterment and your salvation, not happening. Yet Christ came and did it because God, his father, commanded that he give of his life. That was the only atonement. He is completely committed to us fully consecrated to our good and his glory. In verses 22 through 22, he says, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. And so because of our conversion in Christ, because of the work that Christ has done on the cross on our behalf, we are called to live a life of brotherly love. So this is why I love Peter so much. He's laid out the gospel message, the good news of Christ Jesus. But now he gives us a call to action. Hear me. The life of a Christ follower is not passive, church. It is active. It is one of obedience and delighting in his commands. This isn't because God needs our good works. God doesn't need me to serve him. Our neighbor does. Our spouse does. Our children do. Our coworkers need it. Not God. This love that Peter talks about, it's sincere. It's a genuine love that cares for others and considers those before yourself. The greatest example I can think of is the, the love that Christ showed his disciples just hours before his death. When he broke bread, ate a meal that we're gonna get to celebrate in remembrance here tonight in just a bit. And then in those times, I think feet are nasty anyway, and, and I would hate to see what biblical times feet look like because they didn't have closed-toed shoes. And so it was one of the literal, dirtiest, most unclean, nastiest things you could do. And that's not by accident that Christ chose that example to do for his disciples, for his best friends, because he wanted them to see that how filthy they are, no matter how filthy they are, his work upon the cross is what will clean them. So he washed their feet, showing them that, telling them, just in a little while, I'm gonna pay for it. I'm gonna cleanse you. I'm gonna cleanse the sin of the world for those that put their faith in me. 
And then Peter goes on in verse 24 and 25, and this may be why I love this passage the most. He says, all flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. So my day job, I'm a landscaper. And I tell people I get to play in the dirt for a living. Uh, and so this, these two verses really hit home with me. And, and, and so as I was thinking and preparing, I have two takeaways from this. One being that Peter's talking about here that our flesh versus the strength and fortitude of the word of the Lord. Look at the screen and what Jesus tells us in Matthew 24, 35. He says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. His words are everlasting. John 1, 1 tells us that the beginning was the word and the word was God. And then in John 4, verse 1, 14, he says, the word became flesh. Speaking of Christ Jesus, Christ is everlasting. Christ in Matthew there is telling us, I am everlasting. The second thing is that we cannot do this by our own accord. Our flesh is weak and only through the strength and fortitude of the word of God and Christ Jesus can this be done. Our hope can't be of this world, but rather of a life everlasting to come. That's how we walk out day in and day out as obedient children. And so in closing, I wanna leave us with this tonight. Are you living out the word of God? Does your life bear fruit of that? Or maybe you're here tonight recognizing that you need a king to reign in your life. Is Christ reigning in your life? Maybe you call yourself a Christ follower, but Christ doesn't reign over your finances. Christ doesn't reign over your children. Modern medicine does. You do. Maybe you need a king tonight to reign in your life. And for some of you tonight, maybe you came not knowing who you belong to but you're searching. It's not by accident that you're here. And so maybe you are looking to belong. Christ is calling. Put your faith in him. And you will be able to walk as a child in obedience, knowing that you have life everlasting that this is simply a life of exile. Don't let another day pass. I got to be up here earlier today and I heard the sweetest memorial for pastor's grandmother and they called her Gammy. And after both of her sons spoke, both of her daughter-in-laws, her grandchildren you could see that the fruit of her life bore that of a Christ follower walking in obedience. And I sat there and I couldn't help think about knowing what I was going to preach on tonight, thinking, I hope one day that my life has the testimony of others saying he lived a life of obedience because he realized much like Gammy realized that there is life everlasting. This was temporal. Even in her waning hours, she implored Scott. She said, I got to get up. There are others having a hard week I need to pray over. And so I leave us saying, think about this. Can you and I say this? Christ is wholly committed to us. 
Are we fully committed to him? Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you for your word and just the, the scripture and the teaching that you give us through Peter. God, we just thank you for the, the love and, and commitment you have shown us through your son on the cross. Father, let that commitment not be lost on us today. Let us not walk from here. Just counting that is some everyday blessing because it is not, Father. Let us recognize your goodness, your love, your mercy, your passion for us. As we take of communion here in a minute, let us remember that Christ died the death that we deserve so that we may have a life both now and forevermore. Father, I thank you for those in this room. I thank you for this church and this church body. I pray that as we close in communion and worship, that we would remember you and your goodness and your love and mercy for us and that you are calling us home. In your son's name, amen.